Tristram, thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone. I had the opportunity during the first two days to hear the debates, understand some of the issues as you saw them, and check them against that context and view I'd formed from doing the work around serious and organised crime. And I suppose we go back to first principles. What, why was this work important and why is this issue so important for the UK? I think that was shown when part of the Serious and Organised Crime Review was published as part of the government's integrated review. It recognised where serious and organised crime sat as a national security threat and, and recognised that there is increasingly a blurring of the line between high-end serious and organised crime and activities that affect the well-being and future of the state. The review, as Tristram talked about, that I conducted on behalf of the government was a response to the publication of the 2018 Serious and Organised Crime Strategy. And it was really a chance for the government to have a look and take some advice about how far had they gone on the journey. And that was really the context for the work. Um, for, for those that remember back to uh, the early part of uh, 2020, the review was literally landed in Minister's Intray a couple of weeks before we went into lockdown. So for understandable reasons, um, there wasn't a lot of focus on review work as the country grappled with the pandemic. What did we look at? Where are the good news stories? Well, to reassure you, and to reassure everyone involved in this area of work, there are some ex outstanding examples across uh, the UK and wider afield where serious and organised crime is being tackled in an innovative, creative and highly imaginative way with dedicated teams of people from both public, private sector and from third sector working to try and address some of the challenges that uh, we see across the country. But the challenge is it's not at an enterprise scale. The, the things that work really, really well in this part of the country don't work so well in the place down the road, or the relationships aren't good in this part as they are in that part. The reality is that at the moment, at an enterprise scale, the tackling of serious and organised crime doesn't work as a system. And there are a number of reasons for that. You spoke during uh, uh, the last two days about some of the challenges of the definitional problem. And, and people often look and times and say, well, why is that an issue? The reality for policy and decision makers, this issue of defining serious and organised crime means it's incredibly difficult for organisations to set priorities. If you talk to ministers and officials, people are pretty clear what they want. They want less serious and organised crime. But when you say you're actually dealing with a capacity and capability constrained resource, which bits do you want less of? People become less clear. And many of the issues that we wrestled with on the first two days either fe feature high up the agenda or low down the agenda. So part of the work I did was trying to highlight where are the capability and capacity strength constraints uh, in the system as we currently tackle it. The other thing, and we touched on these in our conversations, and it would be fascinating to hear the feedback shortly uh, from colleagues. The other thing that came out loud and clear is a lot of our focus in the UK is very much around what do we do to arrest and bring to justice. So a lot in policing terms, uh, we would talk about the pursue part of serious and organised crime. There is less conversation at a national policy level uh, around protecting and the prevention of serious and organised crime. And I know, as we discussed during the first two days, and certainly the conclusion I made was a lot of these areas are far more admissible uh, and potentially preventable than they are to do uh, post-event investigation, particularly when you get to high-end cyber and economic crime. And some of the scenarios we talk through with people to say, how are we going to think about that? So as UK develops capability in its armed forces to do offensive cyber. Is there, with the proper legal and ethical framework, uh, a role for offensive cyber in knocking down um, uh, sexual crimes on the internet, in knocking down viewing, 
all sorts of areas where you say, look, is there something we can do differently collectively to tackle these issues? Because the other thing that was very, very clear as we looked at some of the capability and capacity constraints in the UK's response to serious and organised crime, we're not going to solve some of these challenges by just doing things in the normal way. And it's not as simple as just saying, what if we invest more money in organisation X or Y? It's a review where I talked about the need for having blended workforces going forward uh, in terms of the response to serious and organised crime and, and how we tackle those issues, bringing the best of all sectors into play in terms of doing it. The other issue that the review touched on in, in, in some detail was this uh, issue of uh, capability development. The 2018 Serious and Organised Crime Review envisaged that capability development would become centralised. There would be a, a, a sort of a national approach to capability development. And really that was twofold. One, that was to make the most use of uh, innovation and creativity across all sectors to tackle this, but also to use that scarce resource of money and funding. Uh, the reality when we looked now at some of the challenges we face is some organisations across these sectors will not have the money or funding to build those capabilities. Because the challenge is, is quite clear. The future looks something like organisations that can work with everything from open source, public, community intelligence, all the way through to some of the most top secret intelligence uh, we hold as a country and as a nation, and can interpret what that means, can understand what it means, can act against it, and can have impact and effect. And they can do that from the very local through to the transnational. Now, it's easy to outline it and explain it like that, but a lot of our organisations that we use and a lot of the approaches we use to tackling serious and organised crime are based on organisations and structures and systems that are often um, geographically constrained, that often have a very strong focus in the local and their ability to move across that spectrum is hampered at times. And this is not just a UK problem. As part of the review, we spoke at length to colleagues from Australia, New Zealand and elsewhere in the world about similar things. And one of the issues that we picked up in the first two days also became a defining feature. I well remember a conversation partway through the review uh, with someone who led a national police force in a, in a country and said to me, Craig, if you come up with a solution to solving fraud that works at a national level, please tell us and we will borrow it. The reality is that a lot of the new and emerging types of crime and threats law enforcement struggles with wherever it is in the world. But it's not all um, uh, doom or despair. The reality is that there are many, many organisations doing some amazing work in this space. The challenge for all of us is how we join it up and how we bring those resources that we've got to bear against it. And this is where the research work is so important. You, a number of you spoke on the first two days about that knowledge of what really works. Law enforcement, law enforcement professionals, wherever they are in the world, need that experience that you bring around the ability to understand what works, what can assist in this space, and what is actually successful. The debate and the way we've broken down the topics highlights one of those perennial debates that takes place uh, in this area and challenges policy thinkers. Are we dealing with tackling serious and organised crime based on particular crime types? Or are we dealing it in a threat agnostic way and attacking threat actors rather than particular crime types? All of these things to many people sound like things that are, that are just sort of mundane and ordinary and routine, but they affect the response and the policy. The other issue in this space that, that many of you wrestle with in uh, academic space as well is the issue of annualised funding. I think one of the things the review did quite well and highlighted for government is some of the challenges of 
fixed term 12 month funding for initiatives in this space. What it means in reality is I called it the eight month effort. So 12 months of funding will probably buy you eight months of effort by the time you've stood up the resources and been able to do the work. And I think also the, the area where academia and others can help is in the skills and capability gap. The skills gap in this area is large and continues to grow. And that's not out of some failing. It's about the reality that we know we need more and more both specialist investigators, forensic scientists, analysts, a whole range of skills are needed in a modern organization to tackle serious and organized crime. You will know, and many of you who work with this sector all the time will know that things like shortage of analysts or analysts that are only used for one particular crime or threat type pose real problems to our capabilities going forward. <laughs> what the review will do is offer the chance to look at these things and benchmark where we are as organizations in terms of, uh, of our tackling of serious and organized crime. Which brings me on to how do we link this into today and, and where do we go today? This afternoon, we're gonna have an opportunity to hear the feedback from the work streams that you were all involved in during the first two days. It's an opportunity to explore some of those issues in more detail, to hear some of the thinking that that's what worked and what hasn't worked, to take away those things where we know we can collectively add something to this debate and move these issues forward in a way that will work for the sector. It's also understanding, and for those of us who are still close to the sector and elsewhere, it's a chance of understanding how we can open up the sector more to research and to those opportunities uh, that I know you need and the sector needs in terms of joining people up to do this work. I will be about for the afternoon. Uh, if you've got issues in relating to the review or other things that you want me to pick up, I'm more than happy to pick them up. I've been asked by a number of people, do we think the government will ever publish the review in full? I don't think it's likely. It was, it was done in the form of advice. Um, the elements of the uh, review formed part of the integrated review, um, but happy to talk in any more detail uh, if there are particular issues people want or some of the comments I made sparked particular interests.